Thank you, uh, Teresa, and uh, thank you for the Centre of Personalised Medicine for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, management of airways disease. And this is an area of medicine where we've got stuck, and sometimes this does happen. Uh, no progress is made for prolonged periods, and in this case it was because of assumptions that we make when we apply a diagnostic label, and we've really had to fundamentally question many of the core beliefs that we have in airways disease in order to make progress, but we are finally making progress. So I have some relevant conflicts of interest. So this is uh, a key outcome in asthma care, which is hospitalisation rates in young people um, over in, from 2000 to around 2010. I don't have a more up-to-date slide, but in, in essence there hasn't been any real change since. And it shows that there's been no reduction in this key metric, nor in death rates from asthma in young people over the last 10 to 15 years. This is a time where in adult males in the UK, death rates from ischemic heart disease have fallen by 70%, an astonishing achievement largely delivered by primary care. So we are lagging behind other, other specialties. And it's not because we're not using more treatment. You can see here the uh, use of uh, uh, asthma treatment cost per capita over roughly the same time period, and it's gone up threefold, and it does seem to increase two to threefold every 10 years. So we're throwing more money at the problem and not seeing uh, improved outcomes. Now we have a choice that in Finland, which does have very good asthma outcomes, uh, spending on treatment is about three times higher than it is in the UK. So we could do that, or we could get smarter about the way we use our treatment and target it more effectively. And I'm gonna suggest that that second approach is the, is the uh, way to go. Not only have we seen a stalling of uh, key outcomes, but we've also seen very poor progress in new drug development. This is a league table, um, and like my football team, Leicester City, in 2015, we, uh, respiratory is bottom of the league table uh, for translating uh, interesting molecular entities into drugs that actually work in patients, with only 3% of drugs getting through that. Uh, pathway. And uh, many drugs are failing at relatively late phase, so phase two and phase three, and this is the period where drug development is very expensive. So a phase three program can cost up to 100 million, maybe uh, 200 million. So this is a disaster for the pharma industry. And it's mainly the UK pharma industry because we manufacture about 80% of asthma treatments in the UK. And it's a big market. It's a 40 billion market every year. So we dominate the market. So a big problem for pharma. But I think a much bigger problem for our patients, and particularly patients with severe disease who are not uh, achieving disease control with existing therapy. And I want to introduce you to Melanie who's a 28-year-old bank worker, one of my patients, three children under the age of five, so in a fairly intense phase of her life, um, developed uh, rhinosinusitis and nasal polyposis in her early 20s, and in her mid-20s, uh, symptoms suggesting uh, airways disease with wheeze, breathlessness, and cough, um, and impairment of lung function was, uh, was noted. Uh, this very rapidly escalated into a very big clinical problem with uh, recurrent hospital admissions, including episodes where she'd nearly died of asthma, so near-fatal asthma attacks. And this was despite her being on everything but the kitchen sink, which is very much our approach to severe asthma. Let's throw everything at the problem, including 20 milligrams of prednisolone, which was having a devastating effect on this 20-year-old uh, woman. So 70 pounds weight gain, mood disturbance. She felt like her life was going out of control. Her husband couldn't cope and left. So it was a mess. And when you saw her in clinic, it was very difficult to tease out what was causing what. Uh, it just all looked pretty desperate. And she 
needs, uh, this is the sort of patient that we see time and time again. Now I'm going to suggest to you that the reason we've got stuck and the reason we don't have new treatments or didn't have new treatments for Melanie was because we've got rather uh, fixated on our outdated Oslerian taxonomy of airways disease. And I really like this quote from Richard Asher uh, from the BMJ. He's a great medical writer. If you do get a chance to read his uh, articles, they're all treasures. Uh, saying that uh, we cast diseases into diagnostic dustbins. And once they're in the dustbin, all thinking stops. Um, and what we need to do sometimes is ferret around into that dust, in that dustbin and pick out people that look different. And that's what we've been doing in airways disease with the goal of coming up with personalised treatments. So in a heterogeneous group of patients, pulling out a subgroup who have a beneficial drug effect uh, with no drug safety issues so that we can better target that treatment. So let's look at the way we view airways disease, and this hasn't changed, I regret to say. So if you read Gina and Gold 2019, they say roughly what they did 20 years ago. Um, so the two major airways disease, asthma, which is a result of environmental and genetic factors, um, results in a eosinophilic airway inflammation, so that's the particular white cell that we see in the airways. Uh, which is responsible for an abnormality of airway function, which we call airway hyperresponsiveness, twitchy airways that narrow too easily, uh, which causes uh, airway narrowing symptoms, and when they get very bad, what we call exacerbations or asthma attacks, a particular problem for Melanie. And in distinction, COPD, very different environmental and genetic factors, cause a neutrophilic airway inflammation, which is destructive and causes fibrosis, loss of lung tissue, and loss of support of the airways, fixed airflow obstruction symptoms, and when they get bad, exacerbations. Implicit in this model is that there's a direct causal link between inflammation, abnormality of function, and symptoms. Thereby, um, symptoms are an adequate surrogate for eosinophilic airway inflammation, which we can't measure, so we need a surrogate. And when applying treatment, which is anti-inflammatory, it's reasonable to use symptoms as a barometer of the success of that treatment. So that's an implicit assumption that we've made. Now that assumption was seriously challenged by two clinical trials published um, more than 20 years ago now. Looking at a monoclonal antibody called mepolizumab, which neutralizes IL-5, which is a key cytokine involved in eosinophil production and maturation. Now, this monoclonal antibody was prof had a profound biological effect. You can see here at the top that for one month after one injection, the number of eosinophils in the sputum, which is a good measure of airway eosinophils, uh, fell at least tenfold. A very marked, we've never seen such a big effect on uh, airway inflammation. But this drug did nothing for patients. So there was no improvement in airway function, shown here. Or subsequently, in a phase 2b study, no improvement in asthma symptoms or peak expiratory flow rate, so lung function. So this was another one of those very expensive failures that we talked about earlier. Now, at around the time that this work was going on, I was very lucky to be working with this guy, uh, Freddie Hargreaves, pictured with his great friend, Jerry Dolovich, in Canada. Now, Freddie was a very quiet, modest Englishman who trained 70 professors of respiratory medicine in his career. So, a remarkable achievement. And he was passionate about measurement of disease, a measurement of airways disease. And while I was there, had developed a technique for measuring airway inflammation using sputum. And this really did work. It was a fiddly technique, but uh, for the first time, we had an opportunity to measure airway inflammation uh, safely in large numbers of patients. And when I got back to Leicester, I played with this technique 
Um, every patient that I saw with airways disease had sputum induction. It was very easy in those days, one page ethics application, yeah, fine, no problem, sounds sensible. <laughs> yep. And that we were off and running. I don't think it would happen these days. And over the next 20 years, I've just summarised what we found, and I can't, I mean, it, it is so exciting when you see things that are not expected. Firstly, eosinophilic airway inflammation occurs in asthma and COPD, so it's not specific to the pattern of disease. So when we categorise patients in our traditional way, we're not identifying discrete pathology. Secondly, the severity of the eosinophilic airway inflammation bore no relationship at all to the severity of the patient's airways disease. So you could have lots of symptoms, no inflammation, and vice versa. Thirdly, when we saw eosinophilic airway inflammation, the patients seemed to be at risk of asthma attacks. That seemed to be the clinical outcome that linked most closely with this process. These are episodes of asthma where Ventolin doesn't work, where they have to go to A&E or um, the acute department of, or G the general practitioner for help. Fourthly, uh, patients with eosinophilic airway inflammation always respond well to steroids. This is Newton's first law of airways disease. It's an immutable law of airways disease. If there are eosinophils, you will respond to steroids. If they're not there, you won't. And the major benefit of controlling eosinophilic airway inflammation clinically seemed to be that patients stopped having asthma attacks. So that was 20 years of work sort of summarised in one slide. And this is the model. We had to change that model because it wasn't working. So it seemed to us that uh, in a patient with asthma and indeed COPD, we are dealing with at least two relatively independent traits. Not totally independent, but relatively independent. On one hand, eosinophilic airway inflammation, which seems to link particularly with asthma attacks. And on the other hand, we have an abnormality of airway function which seems to link much more to symptoms. Now, this model suggests that if you had a drug that took out eosinophilic airway inflammation, two things. One, it's only going to work in patients who have that feature. And we knew that nearly a half of patients with asthma didn't have that feature. And secondly, the main benefit of treatment is going to be a reduced risk of asthma attacks. So we wouldn't see much on symptoms and lung function. This model explains why mepolizumab failed its, its phase 2b trial, because it was applied to people with asthma and symptoms and lung function were the primary outcome. So we did another study where we targeted treatment to patients we knew had eosinophilic airway inflammation, and the primary outcome of the study was asthma attacks. So we recruited people who were particularly susceptible to asthma attacks, like Melanie. And you can see again very marked biological effects, so a very big reduction in blood and sputum eosinophils, not much effect on clinical measures. There was some effect on clinical measures, but not much. But a massive reduction in the frequency of asthma attacks. Uh, so a beautiful, uh, if you like, validation of this new model and this drug went into phase 2b again. Uh, the, the studies were carried out in patients with eosinophilic asthma, and these results were replicated, and it's been on the market for three years. It is a $7 billion drug. So it just shows what you can, what you can get if you get the patient selection right. So Melanie was lucky to uh, be randomized to a phase 3 study of mepolizumab, uh, because we had found, not surprisingly, that she had eosinophilic asthma. Um, and she was able to wean the prednisolone, which was a, a root cause of a lot of her problems, lost most of the weight she'd put on, a marked reduction in other side effects, um, improved lower and upper airway symptoms and lung function, um, and got her life back. I saw her in the hospital. I didn't recognise her, actually because she changed so much. So yeah, a big impact on a patient. 
And since then, we've got a whole plethora of drugs that target this pathological process. And they're all working. They're all uh, arriving in the clinic near you now or in the near future. Uh, broadly, the more completely you inhibit eosinophilic airway inflammation, the bigger the impact of the drug. And the effects on biomarkers are entirely predictable based on what cytokine the drug blocks. I won't go into the details, but these drugs all work. So we, we've got a, a new class of treatment for an asthma. Not asthma, an asthma. Now this is a uh, uh, phase, uh, this is some demographic details of patients that were recruited to the mepolizumab and teotropium studies. Teotropium is a bronchodilator, so it opens the airways, and it's also approved for use in severe asthma. These are the only two new drugs that have been approved for use in severe asthma in the last 20 years. And um, you'll see here the demographics of the patients in the mepolizumab trial. They've got relatively normal lung function, but they exacerbate, they have lots of asthma attacks and high sputum eosinophils. But in, tier, in the teotropium studies, they're entirely different. They've got terrible lung function with good reversibility, but very low exacerbation frequencies. So um, these trials are selecting out of the great unwashed population of patients with asthma, people who have the characteristics or the traits that are associated with good response to treatment. The difficulty is they are then applied in clinical practice in an entirely untargeted way. So we're doing phenotype-specific clinical trials. That's the only way we're going to show drug efficacy, but then we are uh, using the drugs in an untargeted way. So one of the goals of coming to Oxford was to try and get this thinking out into primary care and non-specialist care where the vast majority of people with asthma and COPD are managed exclusively. Um, what I think we need is a new model for airways disease. It's not that difficult. What, what we need to, to assess with a patient um, with airways disease is two things, two what I would call dominant traits that drive morbidity. On the y-axis, the risk of exacerbations as a result of active eosinophilic airway inflammation because we've got really good treatments for that, steroids, biologics. And on the other hand, symptoms as a result of airflow limitation because we've got great treatments for that, bronchodilators. And if we can assess these two relatively independent traits, we can start offering individualised treatments. So our approach in somebody who has symptom predominant disease would be different to our approach with uh, inflammation predominant. So I'm happy to stop at that point. Um, I can talk about uh, why I think it's been difficult to translate this into primary care, but you were giving me signals. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.